Which were the main challenges to the establishment of psychology as a scientific discipline? That's a good question for me because I'm a historian and uh, challenges I think of for psychology as a discipline would be to free itself as a discipline, as a subject matter, from the institutions of medicine and philosophy uh, particularly in Germany and France, because psychologists worked within the medical establishment on pathology, um, mental health. They worked within the philosophical establishment in epistemology and metaphysics. Um, and also during the 19th century, psychology was part of education. You might think of the Pestalozzi School then the Montessori School. Um, psychology began to institutionalize independent of the mother professions of philosophy, medicine, and education. And there were crises. You had a speaker, Annette Mulberger, who talked about the crisis in psychology around 1900 in Europe as the philosophers tried to keep psychology within philosophy. Uh, there was a battle in psychoanalysis, whether it would stay within the medical establishment, uh, which it tended to do in this country, in the US, um, or whether it would stay within the scientific establishment of the university. So in the United States, we have independent schools of psychoanalysis outside of the university system to the detriment of psychoanalysis. But every uh, psychology student uh, learns about psychology as, a, as an independent discipline and as an opportunity to work in the profession of psychology. So it has gained a certain stature and independence in, in the United States and I think in Europe. I can't speak for Brazil. <clears throat> So, according to your view, which are the main transformations occurred in the last decades? Ah, the main transformations in psychology in the last decades. Can I take uh, the decades since mid-century, World War II? Um, so, I would say there's been a feminization of the workforce in psychology. Um, we're now up to 70% of the PhDs are women in the United States. Uh, there's been a tremendous um, proliferation of applications in psychology. Think of the topic of domestic and family abuse. Everyone knows uh, that harassment exists and that there need to be protections against bullying, uh, but that, that awareness, that consciousness of protecting citizens against violence, I think dates from the last 20 years, and I think it's directly correlated with the entry of women into the profession. So that's something I greet, uh, I'm very happy about. Um, uh, what else in terms of changes? Psychoanalysis, I think, has less um, influence, cognitive Therapies have more influence. I think you see that in the DSM-5. It's more technical, the diagnosis of patients today. Uh, they spend less time with the patients uh, doing therapy and more time getting to a diagnosis 
and unfortunately there's been, a, I think, a proliferation of drug therapies. Um, there's a literature on drug culture. Where I come from, I don't know about Europe, um, but I think that's a concern, overuse of, of medication. Uh, child rearing, if you're a parent, a young parent, you have a choice of about 100 uh, child rearing manuals. And I think that is a good thing. There, there's a lot of popular psychology uh, on the market and a lot of awareness uh, that you can improve yourself, self-improvement <laughs> through, through the literature. I see that in Europe and I see that in the US. And I'm guessing it exists in Latin America. Uh, so that's, that's the rough answer. Do you have a follow-up? Um, how do you evaluate the academic training of psychologists in the United States in comparison with other countries? Do you see, for example, any relevant difference between the USA and Europe or between the USA and emerging countries such as Brazil? Hmm. I'm a fan of secondary education in Europe and uh, Latin America. I think um, outside the United States, we have strong secondary education systems. Uh, the evidence of that I see is that people know history, religion, and languages especially. They come out with those tools. I suspect they also learn the basic sciences. On the other side, I see a continuing uh, exodus of students from other countries, particularly India, China, uh, to the United States for higher education, in particular to graduate school in the sciences. So if I could tell a personal story, I rent rooms to international graduate students. I live with them. Uh, we eat separately, uh, we socialize separately, but we, we do a we do learn a lot about each other, and these students are, uh, are confident that they're getting the skills in science and business, by the way, the best skills in the United States. But I think in the long run, this cross-pollination uh, uh, between countries is going to benefit China and India. I think they're going to pull ahead because they're investing in making their young people bicultural. I wish that would happen with Latin America. I wish we could find the funding for Latin Americans to become at least bicultural. And I think the great weakness of US students is that they are not bicultural. They do not get out and come back to the same degree. Now the counter argument would be, we have exchange programs, a semester abroad, two semesters overseas in the junior year of college. And that's also doing well. It does sensitize young Americans, but they're not learning a language. They're not really becoming culturally proficient. So I think that's a weakness. Um, so the question is, again, challenges. Um, I think uh, Asia is doing a great job in meeting the challenges. Europe has always done a good job with languages. Uh, and that's the foundation for traveling to other countries. Uh, we are a monocultural country in which the sciences have been basically occupied uh, by international students. We'll see where that takes us. <clears throat> Do you think psychology has generated new work opportunities? Absolutely. Psychology has generated work opportunities. Uh, new ones. Um, so I've worked in the field of 19th century and 20th century history of psychology and clearly we've gone uh, into a heavy professionalization which includes a proliferation of employment in psychological services in society. So I've lectured on the child guidance movement. So we have social workers who work with psychologists and the courts to help children uh, get rehabilitation or get placed in uh, foster homes. Um, so correction of children rather than incarceration of juvenile delinquents is one example. Uh, what's another example of institutions? 
educational institutions. Uh, John Dewey, at the beginning of the century in America, said you learn to do by doing. It was a pragmatic, instrumental approach to education, but for me, the heart of that philosophy was it was a political philosophy. Everyone has a right to an education in a democratic society. And that philosophy, along with the churches, according to the histories of education, the churches put great effort into um, promoting public education. And that's what we have. However, in the last 20 years, we have a tremendous pressure toward measurement, um, accountability, and privatization in education. We've got a dangerous privatization of the prisons, such that you're making money. The more prisoners we get, the more money certain sectors of the economy make. Uh, and the same is happening in education. Where will this lead us? Uh, privatizing what used to be social goods to make money. Uh, we can even feel the impact in higher education. We're now feeling uh, more and more uh, bureaucracy coming to us to document how we use our space and how we use our time and what we produce. But how do you measure the quality of the students that we educate and the, the educational experience? So I think uh, we're, we're in danger of going too far with accountability. And I think that businessmen um, and women should not be running an educational system for profit. I think we need to defend the role of, of government and freedom in, uh, in, that, in that institution, education. So uh, which hole do you see for psychologists in your fragmented society? What role do I see for psychologists in my fragmented society? In our society, international. Yeah. Well, psychology is, uh, in the broadest sense, a, a healing discipline. It comes out of medicine. Um, it's also a, a discipline that comes from uh, knowledge, seeking truth. Uh, one sign of truth is when we have transparency, uh, but we don't want to co-opt that for business purposes. Um, so, let's see, can you remind me of the question again? Uh, it's in the, tw in the recent years. Uh, how do you see the role of the psychologist in our fragmented society. Oh yes, fragmented society. Yes. Because uh, I don't know if you know Bauman, who is a, uh, a communication uh, terrorist. Mm -hmm. And he speaks a lot of the fluid society and, the, uh, and uh, how uh, he, uh, he explains us that the society is completely fragmented. So how do you see the psychology in this kind of society which is not organized uh, as well as the last century, for example? Very compart compartmented. I don't know if there is a word. The compartments that I recognize are television. Tremendous power of the media, the mass media, um, on our citizenry. Um, Majority of our citizenry believes in the United States that Obamacare is bad. Well, Obamacare is a feeble attempt at a national health system to protect people. But the people it's trying to protect don't know that because of the propaganda of the media. So, and that's a deliberate effort by the corporate establishment to mislead the public. They say you don't need national health care, you need private health care. Uh, but the costs, the uh, New York Times reported last weekend, were health care in the United States is four times at least what it is in any other country. Colonoscopy costs between three and nine hundred dollars in most countries. It costs between three thousand and nine thousand in the United States. An ice pack for your knee after physical therapy costs a hundred dollars in the United States. It just has to be taken out of the cool of the cool shrunk, out of the refrigerator. It's nothing. So we're being exploited by corporations uh, in the United States. Now, I don't know if that's true in Europe and Latin America. Fragmented society, in other ways, we could look at the, uh, the 
poor, the, the class structure of the United States. We have a strong class structure, uh, but we don't pay much attention to that fact. We have uh, massive unemployment, massive poverty, 30 million people uninsured for health. We have massive incarceration. 80% of them are people of color. We have people making money on the incarceration. Uh, the classes are clashing, and there's been a shifting of money toward the top. The top uh, half of 1% has massive wealth, and there's uh, great fragmentation, I would say, in the other classes. Uh, we have women in the workforce. Almost all our, our college students expect to be self-supporting financially. What does that say for children? You cannot expect to have your parent at home anymore because both parents have to work to attain a middle-class existence. I think that's a kind of fragmentation. Then you have the divorce rate, 50% divorce. So you have a fragmented family structure. We don't have the stability that we used to have. On the good side, we have the gay rights movement. Uh, I'm saying that as a political progressive. We have more freedoms for people uh, who were on the margins. We have gay families. We don't have gay marriage, uh, but we at least uh, are, some, in some states, you can uh, uh, marry legally. Uh, there are services that take care of children. I don't see uh, a lot of poverty, uh, of street homeless in Europe. I see a little more of that in the United States, a lot more of that in the United States because we don't have the social net. So fragmentation? Unfortunately, I think I, I like that question because it, it points to a real problem. Um, yeah, single mothers. Yep. I'd like to know a little bit about the current situation of psychology in the United States. How do you evaluate the status, for example, of Freudian psychoanalysis? Okay, I hear two parts, the current uh, state of psychology and the status of psychoanalysis. I'm told that psychology is the largest uh, college major. Uh, that's a lot of students are majoring in psychology. So psychology is taught as an undergraduate subject as a science, um, as a natural science, but also as a human science. You go from physiological psychology to social psychology, counseling, health psychology, and that's tremendous. That means uh, people who are going into the insurance industry, the banking, um, have had a, a basic course in psychology even if they haven't majored in it. Psychology is being uh, taught to almost everyone. So that's good. Um, psychology is then part of our uh, consciousness in the 20th century. Uh, the 20th century has also been called the century of Freud. Uh, that, what does that suggest? Uh, people are aware of the unconscious. People across the world are uh, perhaps aware of childhood sexuality, which means a more tolerant, um, pro-social uh, environment for children growing up, more awareness that identity is important as the behavior of the mother and the father will play into the child's consciousness. That's the dissemination, I think, of uh, psychoanalysis into society. Um, but as a as a profession, psychology is not psychoanalytic in my country, and I would not say in Europe either. I think uh, psychoanalysis is doing much better in South America. I'm a great admirer of psychoanalysis, but um, my wife is a psychologist, PhD, and she tells me that uh, psychoanalysis is, is, a, is a tiny sect among psychologists, uh, that the field has been taken over by a cognitive approaches. She doesn't accept that either. She is trained in the women's uh, in, uh, relational school out of Wellesley College. Uh, and these are just examples of the many different schools. Think about gestalt therapy, behavior therapy, uh, 
family therapy, couples therapy, child therapy. Uh, this is good, this is good news. Uh, but my emphasis in teaching is on the consumer. How do you decide which one to go to? As in medicine, you need a, a GP, a general practitioner, to send you <laughs> to the right specialist. And so th that's a danger if you can't find the right professional person for your needs. But psychoanalysis, I would say, in, the, in North America has been assimilated. In Europe, my sense is it's been balkanized. You have very strong-minded gestalt therapists, behavior therapists, whereas an American therapist will generally tell you I'm, a, I'm an eclectic. I draw from humanistic therapies and so on. Do you have anything to say about the future development of psychology? Hmm. Well, the... Um, I think we have to uh, listen to the economists and the social thinkers and the politicians and pay more attention to the uh, powers of the corporate world, the security apparatus. I think we are being increasingly uh, put under controls. I think psychologists need to be more aware of the political environment and become activists. Uh, one example would be global warming. Psychologists could potentially help to educate the public about the collective dangers that we face. Natural sciences, environmental sciences tell us that we're heading for a social and natural collapse. Now, psychologists should at least be literate about this subject and helping people uh, to overcome a kind of deep despair and helping us collectively to mobilize, to use our resources for, to face a collective trauma. As we run out of resources, as we can see uh, around the world, multiple war zones, we get the worst case scenario for human behavior. We should be studying Syria. What is wrong? Why, what can we do to withdraw the forces of, of battle? And psychologists, I think, have research uh, the Sharif research on peacemaking and conflict reduction, if we could somehow bring that to the politicians, to the role of governmental action, that would be a help. We have NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Uh, we have the United Nations. We do have institutions where we could offer our skills but most of us will continue to do individual work, either therapies or research. That's where we're comfortable. So I'm encouraging more collective action and paying attention to the political crises, which I think we face with the diminishing resources on the planet. Um, regard, regarding the dynamic interaction between individual and society, how could American psychology of the last century, which usually considered only individuals as basic analytical units, deal with theories from Lev Gatsky and Alexander Luria, the Russian psychologists, uh, that point to the linguistic interaction, a typical non-individualistic non action as a basic element that shape individual minds, the reception of Vygotsky in American psychology. Well, I'm very enthusiastic about the reception of Vygotsky and Luria. Uh, what do they offer? They offer a cultural approach to psychology, and yet they focus it on uh, children in part. How can we raise our children with scaffolding and prompting to get them up to a higher level? For example, teach them a language give them opportunities to travel, and then let them go, go higher in their development. Um, so that's promising, and it is true that the psychology of the 20th century has been individualistic. John Greenwood has written about this. Even in social psychology, uh, we study attitudes of individuals in groups. We study group dynamics and its effect on the individual. 
but the unit of analysis is not uh, is not society or classes within society. Uh, so I think psychology needs to learn to look at social structure, to open its doors to social theory uh, and political theory. Personally, I started teaching political psychology because I thought it was uh, something lacking among our students. And I was surprised to find that uh, there's a tremendous naivete among in political behavior. People tend to vote for a candidate on the basis of their, the length of their hair or the way they dress. Or now we have uh, skin color as a factor uh, with our president. Tremendous amount of racism directed unconsciously uh, at an individual. Uh, so these are very primitive bases for <laughs> uh, making a political decision. On the other hand, you have the internet. So those who are literate on the internet know about health policy, they know about foreign policy, they can distinguish between liberal and conservative, <laughs> and they make informed decisions. Uh, so, do you have a follow-up question, or should we move on? Okay, well, so, do you think sociology in the 20th century produced any theoretical contribution to psychology? Sociology. Uh, now, sociology and psychology share a discipline called social psychology in the middle. But I think sociology has had more influence on sociology. You asked me about the influence of sociology on psychology. Um, the Chicago School of Sociology uh, at the turn of the century had an impact um, uh, social representation, social interaction, social behaviorism. Uh, I think that was the last time when social theory had a strong impact. Although if you look at uh, the women's movement, that's a social theory of sorts, which has had a m massive impact. It's caused a social revolution. The structure of the family has changed, structure of daycare has changed, um, professional workforce has changed. Uh, if there is a theory behind that, I'm not sure there is. Um, Postmodern theory, uh, we're more aware of culture and ethnic groups and the dynamics of, of these groups. Um, certainly, in my teaching at the university, we have uh, the teaching of race, culture, and power. We have Africana and African diaspora studies. We have Asian studies. We have Native American studies. Ethnicity is everywhere on the cutting edge of the disciplines. Uh, in terms of theory, we have um, ethno-methodologies. How do you study indigenous people? Um, you can do it through participatory action research which means you go learn the language, let them generate the questions and work with them, uh, even to the extent of doing advocacy to help them better their lives through your research. It's much more, um, potentially more egalitarian. There's a great um, Brazilian, Paulo Freire, Freire who uh, was a, a founder in this discipline. And he is, I don't know how he's been received in this country, but I know he went to another country, and there uh, he's known in the field of education for bringing new methods uh, to the education of the poor, to broaden the base of education. And conceptually, the theory there is that you promote democracy when you educate uh, the lower class, and you help them to overcome oppression. And I would like to think that that theory also educates the elites. The elites learn that there is some power coming from the masses, and they moderate their position from a sheer economic exploitation to uh, something more like we get with unions, uh, negotiating with employers, 
to produce a negotiated settlement. So I'm hopeful that uh, that ethno theory, post-colonial theory, uh, feminist theory, are new versions of social theories that are having a transformative effect across broad areas of uh, of the so-called developed world. But uh, the real challenge is in the developing world. Uh, which way will China go with feminist theory and uh, will they be tolerant? Will their occupation of Africa, as China occupies Africa and U.S. occupies Africa, as we extract resources from Africa, which we are doing, the United States, will there be some good coming out of this? Or will we continue to have indirect slavery in that we impoverish the third world? How will China handle this problem? I don't think we know. I don't think we know the answer. We're seeing uh, some dangerous signs, but that's where psychologists and social scientists can do their best um, to get out of the ivy tower and somehow uh, connect with the agencies, the institutions that are working for social justice. I just haven't been using that word, but uh, that's my favorite concept. <laughs> we need more of that. What contributions the study of history and philosophy of psychology may generate to science, to clinical practice, and to the society as a whole? What contributions? What contributions? Okay, can, can the study of the history and philosophy of psychology generate to science, to clinical practice, to society as a whole? So I've noticed in my own teaching that um, if you teach theory well, it can become a tool for living your life. Uh, you can realize that if you get pregnant, there are options. You need to think this existential issue through. You need to go for professional help and then make your own decision. I give students training in becoming intellectually independent, but being open to communication with parents, friends, religious leaders, whoever you can get information from, and then you must stand up and make your decision. So. Uh, that's an example, one example. Another is uh, the simple uh, problem of finding a career. Women, as well as men, are now facing the necessity of choosing a economic career. It's no longer possible, uh, at least in the United States, to expect a traditional marriage where you will be the domestic partner and you will have an economic partner. With 50% divorce, that's too risky and everybody knows it. So in my teaching, everybody chooses a role model, a pioneer to hitch their life to a star and begin to think about how I would get from here to there. Whether it's a nurse or a businesswoman or an actress, or a dancer, we begin to think about what is necessary to take on a professional identity. Uh, and that's a, that's a kind of a theory because you have to balance, uh, in my teaching, your professional identity with your personal identity. Uh, I say don't, don't be in a rush to marry based on love. Think about some practicalities about do you want to live in the same part of the world? Do you want to bring children into the world or not? Uh, do you want to uh, stay home, go to work, use daycare? Uh, I see those as existential decisions. And so don't stumble into them and then get stuck. Take your time. Go there gradually. And maybe it's a good thing that we now have young people living together. I said maybe. 
because that also has dangers. Once you're living together, you're kind of stuck. So I'm a bit of a moralist. Uh, my discipline in the 19th century was called mental hygiene, producing clean minds. <laughs> and then it became modern under William James and they taught character. <laughs> so I don't use those words, but I am teaching character. Now, who taught character in the 19th century? Moral philosophers. Hopefully they had character. In my lecture uh, here in Luis de Fora about William James, uh, we took his example of character. He waited until he was 34 to get married. And in his proposal of marriage, he said, these are my weaknesses. I tried to commit suicide. I get depressed. I have serious problems. Will you take me as I am? Now, unfortunately, he did not keep the letters from his wife. We don't know if she said, uh, I too have weaknesses. <laughs> Will you take me as I am? But uh, we do know they were married uh, for years, had f at least four children, that they lived a traditional marriage. But marriage, he said, is a moral burden, a moral responsibility, how we live our life. Now, is that a philosopher's notion? Would Socrates agree with us? How we live our life is a moral task. Yeah. Uh, practicing honesty is important. Uh, so when I say there's a, a, a planetary crisis, I think we need to be honest. We need more open discussion. Some would say we have a moral crisis around abortion. So let's discuss it. But maybe uh, let's be tolerant. <clears throat> Are there some lessons to be learned from the history of psychology? If so, which are the most important ones? Lessons from the history of psychology. <laughs> well, psychology changes. Uh, psychology responds to the society. Psychology uh, can work for the good. Uh, there are many jobs in psychology uh, where we can work with children, we can work with adults, we can go into medicine with our psychological training, we can go into business with, with psychology. Uh, human relations, personnel, human resources, behavior of organizations. Uh, there are so many inroads from this largest university major into society. I think that uh, this is something that South America and North America have to offer to Europe and Asia and the Pacific Islands. I think we have a strong foundation of history of psychology uh, in conjunction with a strong uh, philosophy. Now, I teach a unit on Turkish psychology and Chinese psychology, and I'm aware that both of those cultures feel the impact of colonial North American psychology and medicine. They feel a strong need to reinvent an indigenous Turkish psychology and an indigenous Chinese psychology. I'll give two examples. Turkish psychologists would like to preserve the family. They see a dissolution of the family in the West. And what they propose based on uh, values surveys in, all, in about 16 countries is that as families become economically independent, your children become economically independent, you can remain emotionally connected. So that leads me to ask in North and South America, do we remain connected in our families as we move far apart? And in China, you have the uh, a surprising concept of destiny, uh, yuan, Y-U-A-N, the same word as the word for money, but destiny. Uh, Chinese have a, a, a capacity to work collectively, to do what is best for the state. Now, communism, of course, is laid onto this notion of destiny, 
but I show a film about divorce Chinese style, they come and they tell you, no, you cannot divorce. You have to work it out, and they show you ways to do that. That's an example of forcing destiny and not allowing the kind of uh, individual freedoms. Uh, you work for the public good uh, in that society, apparently, and that's an in, indigenous contribution. What are your impressions from your visit to the Federal University of Juiz de Fora and to its center in history and philosophy of psychology? I, two minutes. Oh, well, there's a tremendous amount of energy here, and it's an interdisciplinary energy. Uh, it begins with four professors who have training in philosophy and psychology. But these four people are tremendously uh, cultured, and they're tremendously skilled uh, in diplomacy, in um, bringing uh, new energies to the human sciences which is a larger unit. To translate that for the North American audience, to me that's the liberal arts. Look at what can be accomplished if the liberal arts work together and really believe in their mission and use these two orthogonal disciplines, history and philosophy, to educate. I think, uh, I think it's marvelous. Uh, don't forget the, the internationalism, internationalism of your of, one of the young faculty, I think more than one. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience, but um, Dr. Arai Joe clearly has traveled and brought new uh, ideas from North America and Europe. And I hope that uh, other opportunities will come to all of you and, uh, and to your students. I think uh, financing those opportunities is a huge challenge. I want to look for ways, uh, for example, for North America and South America to really believe in international exchange. I think working together, uh, we could really make some things happen. So yes, this, this university, um, unique in South America, is offering um, a focus for intellectual and social change through the history and philosophy of psychology and the support of the human sciences. I'm very optimistic about that development.